Uh, my name is Rajesh, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Redmart. And uh, here my colleague uh, Surya is the DevOps lead, you know, who will actually talk more, more about the actual testing process itself. I'm here to just give us a, a bit of intro. Okay, and uh, we also have uh, our uh, release engineer also who is also taking care of the parts of the DevOps as well. Okay. Um, uh, we are here to talk about how we are actually testing microservices. Uh, we just started actually um, breaking up our monoliths into you know, multiple microservices. We already have about 30 plus uh, services, and uh, uh, all of them are actually in uh, AWS. So we are just here to talk about how we are doing it, get some feedback, improve it, and you know, see how where else we can actually go from here. Uh, this is the rough agenda. Um, that basically tough journey uh, testing overview and what we are really doing there. Uh, just a brief about Redmart. Uh, it was founded in 2011 in Singapore and we have raised uh, about 70 million. That's the latest round we, uh, we got uh, recently uh, uh, through several rounds, obviously, and we have about 500 employees. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, blue collar here because the drivers and you know, pickers and a lot of them. 60 plus engineers, and uh, we rely heavily on tech to optimize uh, uh, operations as well as dispatch, and uh, besides the uh, apps that you might already be aware of. So this this talk is you know partly to show you know what else how, how else we are using tech. Uh, just briefly, as I said, um, uh, we started out as a single monolith. Most of you might have already done the same thing. Um, it is, it's basically the, the typical startup journey, right? So we started with a, a monolith uh, in uh, July 2013, and we started growing 15, 20% month over month. It was good enough to actually grow along with it. But uh, along with it also, we started getting uh, uh, growing the team as well. Now we have like 60. Back then it was just four or six engineers working on this. Monolith was fine. We could easily deploy and all the stuff. Uh, but uh, it became harder and harder to make releases as we moved on. So that's when we started actually breaking it up into smaller pieces. Like this is a known story, right? I'm just repeating the same thing here. Uh, so that's when we actually started doing it, like uh, back in 2014. Uh, but the pro the problem, as you know, with microservices is that if your tooling is not good enough, you know, it, it, it acts a lot of overhead, you know, to basically. Uh, test, deploy, maintain microservices. You have instead of one big monolith, you have like uh, 30, 50, or 100 services. How do you actually do that? So that's uh, you know, how do you actually deal with that? That's a that's a big uh, uh, thing we were trying to solve. Uh, so yeah, this is basically our story and uh, a quick uh, intro about uh, like our uh, set setup. Uh, everything quite you know quite standard. You know, you know nothing out of the world. GitHub, Travis, S3, Chef on the infrastructure side, and on the dev, you know, the, in terms of uh, development, whether it's on the box or the you know, test setup itself, it's a vagrant-based setup where anybody coming in is basically ramped up you know, pretty quickly with all the necessary tooling uh, with Vagrant. And uh, we, we recently switched to GitHub Flow. We used to use Git Flow. Uh, we slowly switched to you know, GitHub Flow. Uh, we are almost through it. And uh, we are also actually adding um, you know, Sonar Cube into the stack as well, so that you, know, uh, you can see the code quality and all those things. Uh, so it's been quite some time uh, we have used uh, Sonar Cube. Now it has a lot of good plugins. If you're not used it yet, you should actually go and try it out. It basically checks most of the you know, most of the code quality issues, and uh, it also gives a lot of feedback as well directly to the pull request. So that's and that's what we are excited about. And uh, very briefly, uh, this is our infrastructure. Uh, we have three different uh, stages. One is the dev or test, which is which we call as alpha. And uh, there is a pre-prod, uh, which is called beta. It's a misnomer. And uh, the other one is the prod, which everybody else sees. Um, we have around 142 PC2 instances. We are 100% on AWS, including our third-party services. Everything runs on AWS itself. Uh, so, 140 instances and 30 plus uh, mic uh, microservices uh, with like front-end apps and all those things. 
So uh, you can see the amount of complexity. So we use uh, Chef to manage our entire infrastructure. So you might have heard this term code infrastructure as a code. So Chef you know, basically is the kind of CM tool we are using for that. You could be using Puppet or something else, but uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, in our case, we are using Chef, and we also talked about uh, how we are doing this entire CI, CD in the same uh, in the meetup uh, sometime back. Uh, it has worked out quite well, but uh, till we got into microservices with like loads of different services, multiple instances of each uh, service, you know, we, we wanted to actually do something more cost effectively. You know, instead of having a separate setup for every team, you know, we wanted to actually carve out a small setup within the existing alpha environment. That's what we are going to talk about. Um, just one last thing. Yeah, so this is the regular stuff. Uh, we are using Frisbee and Mocha for endpoint testing, uh, all our APIs. And uh, web apps, uh, mostly Selenium, and uh, mobile apps is Kalamash. So we'll mostly be touching uh, the setup for end-to-end -end testing itself. That's, that's basically what uh, we are here for. Okay, uh, this is our setup. I'll let uh, our DevOps lead take over. Is the man who actually built this. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Surya. So, yeah, I was hired as the first full time DevOps <laughs> in Redmart. Yeah, so basically, as you know, uh, uh, like Rajesh has mentioned, uh, we actually move away from the big monolith app uh, itself into microservices, but all this kind of uh, migration uh, will not happen overnight, right? Because it's such a big thing, you know, and then uh, we have like all the resource con constraints and all that, so we are slowly moving, uh, and then, uh, yeah. So basically the big uh, monolith app that we have previously is called uh, this in this layer, which is our uh, API. It used to be very thick, uh, it, uh, it processes a lot of things there, but uh, uh, we are slowly stripping away all these uh, functionalities from this uh, big app into smaller services. So uh, on the front end we have uh, Nginx, uh, and uh, from there, then uh, it goes direct. Uh, so some of the, the, the services that are still uh, handled by the API, which we do not have the microservice yet, uh, will still go to the API box itself, this layer. Some uh, that we already have the microservices uh, implemented, it will actually go direct uh, to, to the services itself. So all this uh, is done through the uh, uh, help of the Nginx and the HFPC routing itself. So if you can imagine how uh, intensive actually uh, we, we make use of the routing in Nginx and the HF proxy. Um, so the thing uh, about microservices is that once you have this, uh, and you heard just now we have uh, hundreds of uh, instances uh, running, the issue is that uh, how do we actually uh, get down to the testing, right? So let's say you, you, you want to... Uh, uh, implement certain new features, let's say for only one service, how do you actually uh, make sure that this testing, uh, you are able to replicate as close as possible to the uh, alpha and the production environment without actually uh, bringing up all the other services all over again. We could have like, uh, you know, the developers themselves uh, setting up the services on their local machines, but uh, it will be like still not close to what we have in the alpha and production, right? So with my, our feature uh, testing, we actually uh, built something that allows us to actually just uh, plug a new service that is implementing new features, uh, whereas uh, the rest we can reuse what we already have in the alpha uh, environment. So it means that it allows us to also do uh, concurrent testing because a lot of people will be doing a lot of testing, you know. Some of them are testing on the on the stable alpha uh, environment, uh, which should not be disrupted when the new feature is being implemented and tested. But at the same time, uh, the new feature uh, we don't want to, you know, cross over with the uh, or disrupt or uh, yeah mess around with the the, the the stable testing environment. 
So what happens is that uh, with the help of again Nginx and the HA proxy, we actually uh, are able to do that. So how uh, it goes is that, uh, uh, so the stable alpha, we have the alpha.redmart.com, but when we have a new feature, we will call it the uh, feature.api.alpha.redmart.com. Uh, um, yeah. And then uh, we added the feature based routing uh, over here. Um, so uh, for alpha, uh, we usually call it just api.alpha.redmart.com that hits uh, uh, our uh, alpha uh, uh, box there. Um, whereas for the feature uh, testing, we if we need the API, because the API currently is still uh, one of the critical components, so any new features usually you know, uh, will require some change, or uh, even though it is, it might just be like config change and all that. So uh, it will, we will create this, and we'll call it the feature X of API.alpha. So everything is actually very similar to what we have in the production, except that you know uh, the, the the URL name itself is uh, different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, with this environment, uh, what we are able to achieve is that the developers they are able to actually work in a feature branch without touching the the, the uh, alpha branch. Uh, previously, we were in the Git flow. We have the develop and the master. So, without touching the develop branch, they can actually uh, actively, you know, uh, working on the feature branch. Uh, and at the same time, they actually gets to deploy in a very uh, environment that is very close to the alpha. So, until they are ready, then they will push the code to develop. And then uh, to, to accomplish this, we actually uh, have to do some changes in the headshot proxy, which I'm going to show uh, a little later. Yeah. So, so just to show you uh, how uh, the, the the flow is like. So this uh, is the the normal alpha environment without the feature uh, testing in place. So how it goes, the route is that uh, it is marked in green. So all the green boxes uh, marked here, they are uh, actually the, the uh, what we call the alpha boxes. So uh, they, these boxes are running on the develop on the master branch of the GitHub flow. So um, if let's say you need to call the, the order service, you know, like for example, we have the order service here. Uh, what it does is actually process the orders that are coming in, right? So um, it goes through, uh, this used to be part of the API, but uh, we have actually split it up and uh, make it into a microservice. So if you want to hit this, you know, you will, uh, instead of going through the API, uh, you will go through the HF proxy direct and go to the order service. Whereas uh, um, uh, for those services that are still in the current API, we will just go here direct. Um, and next slide. Uh, then we have the feature testing. So let's say uh, we call it like feature X. This will be the route itself. So let's say the changes that we are making uh, is only uh, uh, specific to this order service. And then um, um, we have uh, probably some minor or config changes in the API. Uh, so for this feature X, let's say we require these two uh, services to be modified. So what happens is that uh, in the how we hit the API, we just append the feature X in the URL itself. So in the engine X, we will see okay if uh, there is uh, this feature in the in the in the path itself, we will direct it to the uh, API that is for this feature. Whereas for the other services that doesn't uh, have uh, this feature in the uh, path, we will direct them direct to the uh, uh, the, the stable alpha uh, boxes. I mean, it will become clearer when we uh, go through the uh, next slides. Um, yeah. So this is let's say. So as you can see, we have two concurrent feature being implemented. So feature X, feature Y. So uh, if you want to hit feature X without uh, you know bothering about feature Y, you can do that. And then if somebody is working on feature Y, they can also do that. 
yeah, this will be the path. So all the other services that are not affected, it will just go to the uh, green boxes, whereas all the services that are affected will go to the uh, orange boxes. So uh, oh, one thing also, uh, is you can see here, in the path itself, uh, previously, I mean, in the, in the normal alpha environment, we will just use a version uh, when we go to the uh, uh, HF proxy. So uh, version X, Y, Z, for example. And then we make use of this uh, uh, path-based routing in the HF proxy to actually determine, um, uh, if, let's say there's this feature Y in the uh, path itself, the HF proxy will, uh, will know that uh, it has to direct to uh, this box instead of uh, the normal order service. So you can see that this is where uh, HF proxy is picking up. Uh, so yeah. Can you see there's no version there? Yeah, because this is for feature implementation, right? So we do away with the version. Uh, whereas uh, the version that we have in alpha is actually uh, the same as what we have in the production. Yeah. So since this is a feature, we'll just uh, make use of there's no version because it's still being built. Okay. Yeah. So later on we'll start adding it to one or two. So once uh, this is tested, right, um, they will the, will merge uh, from this feature branch because this is still in the feature branch. Okay. We'll push this into the uh, develop or the master branch, right, uh, and then uh, from there, uh, once it is released, then we'll tag it with the version. Okay, so uh, how did we do this? Basically, we have uh, 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 created uh, several pools so for the developers actually to uh, to access this uh, when they need to create a new feature environment. So uh, other than that, we will have the Nginx changes, HF proxy, and we realized that uh, even though we have all this, uh, if it is like too complicated. Um, it is hard to get everyone you know, to move uh, fast into this. So what we did is actually we have built a tool basically to automate uh, all this process. Later on you can see what are the processes that are involved and what the tool takes care of. Yeah. So uh, what do we have? Right now we have uh, three server pools. We have the front-end team, we have the fulfillment team, and, uh, yeah, and uh, another back-end team. Uh, and then each pool, we have about 5 to 10 uh, server pools. So uh, the reason why uh, we, we come up with server pools is that uh, we want to assign a, 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 each team actually uh, a, a certain responsibility uh, because uh, we don't want like, each team to be able to just uh, create uh, uh, new instances you know, uh, without limit. So with these server, server pools, actually, they share within the team. So if uh, the problem is that when people uh, build something, after they are done with it, they sometimes you know uh, they might forget or for whatever reason, uh, the cleaning up part is usually uh, is 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 quite hard to get everyone to uh, do that. So with this, actually, they take the responsibility to make sure that you know because if you use for certain services uh, certain features and you don't clean it up the other teams or the new features are not going to uh, be able to, to deploy because the, the pool, uh, all the servers inside the pools have been used, right? And the other thing is also uh, in terms of uh, security-wise because like uh, we have to consider the fact that uh, uh, AWS security so we don't want everyone to be able to create uh, instances uh, themselves, right? Uh, so what happened is that with these server pools, actually we can start and stop when uh, they are in use. We will start uh, these servers, so it means that the developers will only have access to run and start uh, the instances. So when they are done with the testing, then they can uh, stop these uh, instances. So uh, what are the Nginx changes? Uh, so, like I uh, showed earlier, uh, for the normal uh, alpha, we have the version as part of the route. Uh, whereas for the feature testing, 
we have uh, this uh, feature name as uh, part of the URL part. So uh, these are, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not a big change. Uh, it's just a minor change. Um, yeah, for this. And then uh, the, for the on the HF proxy side, uh, uh, we make use of the path-based routing uh, in HF proxy. So what it does is, uh, uh, I think this one is uh, most of you will be familiar with. But this one, I think, uh, I mean, uh, not that many people are making use of it right now. Uh, so uh, what we can do is actually with HF routing you can uh, specify a certain uh, path in the URL and then we acti activate this uh, ACL uh, on it. Uh, so it means that if in the URL you don't uh, provide that path itself, this uh, ACL will not be activated and it will just go into the default uh, backend uh, upstream. Whereas if you have this and then uh, this feature will, uh, this ACL will be activated and then uh, it will go to the uh, feature uh, backend uh, which is specified here. Yeah. So, yeah. so what are the things that are going on? Uh, as you can see there are a lot of uh, things that are going on here. So uh, how does the process uh, start? So first of all, the developers themselves, they will have to create the feature branch um, in their GitHub repo. So it begins uh, with this. Um, and then what happens next is that we need to create a separate role because you know uh, we have uh, everything uh, um, implemented like uh, all those uh, CI and CD, right? So if we are not careful, actually when we push something to the, uh, to the developer branch, actually uh, without clear separation uh, in terms of the role itself, uh, you know, some of those uh, features, uh, the, the, the servers that is being used for this feature testing, they might get uh, affected. So uh, we separate that uh, with this uh, uh, role so in chef itself we create a new role just for this uh, feature and then uh, after that uh, we have to go into the server pools uh, and check okay which server is actually currently free uh, not in use and then we'll pick it up uh, the next thing it has to do is actually it has to start the server so like I said earlier we have the server pools when they are not in use the servers will be uh, in stop state so uh, as long as we find one server that is free, we'll pick it up and then uh, we'll start that service. Uh, after starting that uh, uh, EC2 instance, then we can do the uh, bootstrapping. Um, this is uh, the chef bootstrapping. So uh, as, you, as you, if you remember that, the first step, they created the feature branch, right? It means that when we want to deploy into this server, we need to pick up uh, the, the artifacts uh, also from that feature branch, right? We, we don't want uh, this server actually to pick up from the uh, alpha branch. So uh, Chef, we do it through Chef. Uh, after that is done, actually there's uh, some other steps that needs to be done. Um, because our HF proxy and the Nginx are also managed uh, via Chef. So what happens is that uh, we have to upload the data bags uh, that is being used for HF proxy and Nginx. So that the HF proxy will pick up, okay, for this server and this, uh, for this service and this feature, where shall I go to? And the same for the Nginx, for this uh, feature uh, route, where should I direct it? So uh, after we pick up the server, we bootstrap it, we have to uh, still upload this and then, yeah. Uh, so as you can see, uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 steps involved. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We have so many steps involved there. And then we have so many systems, so many services, and then the teams are growing uh, so fast. and then. Not only that, we have uh, like for each service, we might have like 
multiple features being implemented for a specific service itself. And then worst of all is that we have so many deadlines. Everybody will just be like, you know, wanting to push their, their features to their production as soon as possible. So how did we do it? Uh, yeah. So we make life simple for the developer. If you see the things that is in red and green, red means that that is the only step that the developers have to take care of. So they will just have to worry about the uh, GitHub repo and make sure that they have created the feature branch. And then uh, they will just run this tool and then the tool will actually uh, do all the magic and uh, then they do the rest. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so uh, before we move on, uh, maybe you guys uh, have any questions? Uh, I'm going to ask that you're adding an API route to the Nginx, and you usually need to be a or something like that. Do you use anything like um, Lua on Nginx to handle that reload or do you just reload the whole Nginx process? The reloading of the Nginx itself? Yeah. So you're adding something to the API route, right? Usually you need to reload to pick up the configuration chain. Yes. So you do a reload or using something like um, Lua on top of Nginx to get everything on the routing on the other. No, we will reload the Nginx directly. Yeah. But the conf itself is version. Sorry? The configuration itself is version, so we can reword. Yes, yes. The config itself is done like uh, integrated through the chef and all. That's why we actually need to once we make the changes, we uh, register. We have to register this server into the Azure proxy, right? And the engine X itself. So all these are, are done through the data back itself. Yeah. And and yeah, uh, as you can see, I mean, we'll just uh, automatically you know uh, uh, update the Azure proxy in the Nginx. Yeah. So basically, everything is like a bootstrap from Chief, right? So everything in the green. Yeah. So once it's triggered. Detected in the GitHub, it's start creating all these steps. Yes. Bootstrapping environment for the yes for the test. Yeah. So basically, the, once they have to make sure that the feature branch is present, yeah. and uh, they have to make sure that the build is successful and is uploaded to the artifacts repo. We are using the AWS S3. So they have to make sure that this repo is there. After that, then they can run this tool uh, just to create the uh, feature test environment. So, you have only one big service on the website, so how much time the cycle will be? The cycle? You mean uh, from feature to production? From feature to production, it depends on the complexity of the feature as well, right? Um, Let's say it's a single change. What's the average factor? And what happens to the active sessions? Uh, if it is just a simple uh, change, it usually takes uh, very fast. Probably just a few days. Uh, actually, rollout itself. I think that's the question. Yeah, from the rollout. So if there is, uh, I mean, if there's nothing major that uh, affects the, you know, the uh, especially like payment logics and all that. Uh, usually, it takes like a uh, few days to maybe one to two weeks. But uh, certain big features, uh, it may take longer. Yeah. That is end to end. But uh, well, if the question is just the rollout part. No, uh, what happens to the active session is obviously, for example, you know, on the production side, let's say uh, it's a single problem that we are also facing like, yeah. so, I have, let's say, two users are active on my website, I'm, I'm rolling out two channels. So, okay. is it that down in a small universe? Yeah. It takes about 2.3 uh, seconds to 3 seconds. Yeah. So, we have to keep the active session as a there has to be some mechanism that has to be that you would be True. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in our case, most of the services are stateless. That means 
I don't care whether it comes to instance one or instance twenty. You know, we can actually stop that. But what we what we do have is that for critical services, like for example, payment processing and a couple of other critical order uh, processing systems, we do have graceful shutdown. That means that uh, before upgrading, we, we actually do uh, one instance at a time. We are actually not uh, uh, going at, the, at once. So graceful shutdown the first instance, and then deploy the new feature, and then slowly move on. Yeah, uh, service level, yes, we do. We do the. Uh, we basically run uh, pseudo chef client, which basically brings the entire uh, artifact into the service level itself after it has gracefully shut down. But otherwise, for most of the cases, like you're browsing the catalog or whatever it is, you wouldn't even know. Maybe if, if at all the uh, restart an instance in the middle of a session, nothing will happen. Actually. Nobody will notice it. Yeah. Yeah. And in your case, you may write this one of the options. You put the state of the connectivity in the Redis or in the cookies, for example, whatever you choose. Even if you restart the services, mine doesn't lose connectivity. Yeah. We are actually using it to cache, but still we have to clean up the cache after. Yeah, I think the value of the Redis is pretty much used in this case in memory database. Correct. Uh, we don't use uh, Redis heavily for that. The session tokens are actually in Redis. Itself. That's the only way you can actually get. Uh, Safe, uh, 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 not being safe, though, that's all. So, state was basically. There must be somewhere to say that, okay, this is the token, and you know, how do I deal with this, whether this is a not being user or whatever. There. So, for that, we are using very simply. And also, just to add on, like uh, some of those critical services that require like this kind of graceful shutdown, you probably have to. Uh, detach this node from the HR proxy or the engine X itself. So uh, we can do it through the data back as well. Like from the engine X, we will uh, just deprecate this uh, servers or temporarily. So it means that the engine, engine X knows that this server will be down. So it will not be directing traffic to it. And then we'll see the lock, you know, if there's no more uh, traffic coming in, then we will uh, yeah, upgrade. Sorry, just one quick question. Um, so the start of this, it's not started directly from when they create a branch, right? They've created a branch, they've done some work, they've implemented a feature, and they've produced an artifact, okay? And that goes up to S3. And then they run the tool and it does all the steps and then deploys, yeah. and then redeploys. But you can obviously do um, produce multiple artifacts from the same feature branch. If you, for example, produce like version one, version two, version three, etc. How are your artifacts then tied back up when you merge your feature branch into uh, develop? Or is that a stupid question? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's feature branch like version. Uh, 0.0.5 that was actually like the final one that implemented the feature and passed all the testing and all the edge cases when they go to move to merge feature branch A back into develop. Yes, yes. Uh, that's similar to the question this gentleman asked as well. So uh, we had this question whether we should actually version the feature branches as well. We kind of decided not to do that to reduce the complexity. Right. So what it means is that if at all you want to roll back or whatever it is, you still have a commit ID. Okay, so so when I introduce an artifact on a feature branch, I overwrite the artifact in place of the one that I produced before. Yes, yeah. okay. feature, feature yeah. branch is not going to break anything. Yeah, uh, sure. custom okay. Anything. So okay. we are kind of liberal on that aspect. Okay. But uh, we do have exactly like what you mentioned for the production environment, where we keep uh, five previous instances. If at all the new one is you know, breaking the build for breaking the production system for whatever reason, we can roll it down. Okay. And that's what we're doing. And yeah, maybe just to add on, like this feature branch uh, artifacts is gonna be different from the one that we have for alpha. So it means that it will not affect the alpha. So you read so you don't merge the artifacts, you don't just point to new artifacts, you would merge and then you recreate the artifacts. So after what happened is that, yes, after yeah. you merge, sure. then it gets deployed in the alpha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is to basically 
not to block the alpha environment, the test environment. So I can test the feature for weeks in a row without actually blocking the alpha environment itself. So when I'm really happy about the feature, all the services are tested fully, only at that point I would actually go and merge it into the developer branch. So and, and keeping in mind that when we say testing in alpha, it is not just the developers. All the uh, you know consumers, uh, teams, and all that you know when they are testing like new product, new catalog, and all that they will be doing that in that alpha. So we have to make sure that that alpha is always good; it's not broken. Are you using the same thing for A/B testing as well, or the same the same kind of setup? Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, we are, uh, we could you know, we could potentially use that, and uh, also the uh, Google's tool as well. Um, but uh, uh, in production, we are actually using the site spec. Yeah, that's all. Site spec is a commercial tool. We are using that for every test. It's something like optimized Yeah. 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 How do you handle if two services that have made to talk to each other both need changes that are simultaneous? Um, so two know, services. Yeah. So for the same A feature, and B both need a change. For the same feature, right? I guess it would be the same feature. Yeah. Be, uh, yeah. Which we, we have in this case, right? Let's say, uh, in this case, we illustrate the case where you need to change the API itself uh, and then the other service itself. So it's already like two services. So it could be just at the service level itself. Yeah, of course. Like the, on this level, microservices themselves, they could have the. Probably other than other services, there are other services that are being changed. You know, for this feature X, and then uh, how they access each other is actually through this uh, URL route. Yeah. It's a, it, is this one one Git repo, or then multiple Git repos for each? We have <laughs> we have hundreds of repos. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's if I do. If I do, uh, like, I just make sure that my feature branches are labeled the same and, like, you know, so I'm using, making a change that uses three of your repos, they, like, call it, like, feature Y, in one feature Y and one feature Y and the other. And one sure, sure, and then, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. A, then, that's the only requirement. <laughs> and then it just goes. Through. Good point, yeah. 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 That's, that's the main requirement. If, if I'm, I'm modifying something and Suda is modifying something else for the same feature, they have to basically use the same feature. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's where uh, actually we have to try and make it sim as simple as possible, which we develop the uh, uh, Vagrant uh, tool itself. So the, the tool itself, if you know, I'm the only one who is uh, creating the, the environment for them, it's very easy. But then the thing gets uh, complicated when you have, you want to put these tools into the hands of the developers. <coughs> because like you have to make sure that uh, they're able to set up this tool uh, on the machines, and you know, uh, this I, I I just had like a bad few bad experiences. Like, you know, uh, one one guy he had his chef environment working there, but not in AWS, you know, and the other guy uh, had some other problems. So, uh, to mitigate that, actually, we we decided that to make it as simple as possible for them. So we created this uh, uh, fragrant uh, template. So what uh, they have to do is just to uh, uh, download uh, this fragrant uh, template itself, and then uh, they just run an init script. That script will actually create the uh, fragrant uh, 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 machines and also all the necessary setup inside that machine itself. So that includes uh, pulling like the Git. Uh, uh, repo that we have for uh, you know because you know all this we manage to share so we have to make sure that every developer they are in sync if let's say two guys you know they are working and we don't want like uh, the first guy to pick up this server and the second guy picks up the same server right how do we make sure that uh, that does not happen so we make it as simple as possible before they run the script we will do the automatic git pool and then uh, once uh, the data back is updated, we will automatically uh, push it to Git and they don't have to worry about uh, all these things. Yeah. So, so this is the exact steps that uh, is required if you guys are interested. Uh, we can 
you know, later on we'll talk more about it. Yeah, basically. So after the testing is completed, like I said, uh, the key thing is how do we make sure that they are able to clean it up themselves without, you know, every time. Because you imagine the number of teams that we have, the number of developers that we have, uh, if everyone, you know, comes bugging for this, you know. Uh, yeah, so what we do is actually we have uh, even like, First of all, you have to clean up that EC2 instance, right? Because it was used for the other microservice. We have to make sure that uh, you know uh, the artifacts, the deployment there is clean up, so so that when you deploy a new service, it doesn't get you know uh, uh, messed up. And then after that, we want to put uh, the EC2 instances uh, to stop state, and then uh, return the server back into the server pool so that they can be reused. And then after that, we have to make sure that those routings are clean up. Because otherwise, you know, our engine X config will just grow. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing is that we're able to do that with a single click. Too bad we didn't have the time to prepare the demo today. Otherwise, we would have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so we do destroy the instances rather than just put them, just shut them down. Yes. yes. Because like I said earlier, if we uh, we could like destroy them and create each time, but then uh, you have to give this permission, right, to each of the developers because they have to run it on their own. We don't want this. Yeah. So sorry, are you deploying uh, multiple services per instance? No. No, so one Single. service per instance. Yes. Okay. One server for all your microservices plus the one that the developer is working on for instead of one box. So no, 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 no. One service uh, will be on one EC2 instance. Okay. Yeah. So mostly they are micro instances. Yeah, micro instances. Yes. When you mentioned micro instances, for example, for. Uh, do you use Docker for that? No, no, we are using the EC2 uh, T2 micro instance. Okay, for what reasons is. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it will be more efficient to simulate, for example, the services to create and for example, using the micro docker. Docker, yeah. That's yes. a very good thing. No, no. Uh, that is now. We are moving into that soon. Yeah. Because, yeah, like you said, we realize that I mean, a lot of these micro instances, even though they are just micro, but then the utilization is actually very low. So it makes sense that you need to put like multiple services in one box, but we want to make sure that to the developers it's just like one box clean, not just you know one box is shared for multiple services. Yeah, we'll get into that soon. Yeah. So the things that is uh, still, I mean, do we have everything fully automated right now? Most of the things we, we are able to automate, but there are still like a number of uh, things that we are still not uh, uh, able to do yet. Like for example, like the queue dependent services. Like uh, for example, certain services they they pick up uh, messages from the queue. We want to make sure that you know, this uh, when we deploy in the feature environment, they are not picking the uh, messages that is meant for the uh, stable alpha. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, because the logic might have changed uh, within the new uh, the new feature implementation itself, and it might uh, disrupt the the other flows. Yeah. So that itself we do not uh, uh, automate yet. Uh, we but uh, what we have been doing is actually for like these kind of services, we require them to uh, create a separate queue each time for this uh, specific feature implementations. And um, we could have chosen between like a separate key, a queue or the routing key. But for now, I think uh, mostly we'll go with the separate queue. Um, so once uh, they, they, they are done with the uh, feature testing, they will have to clean up this queue as well. And then the versioning itself, it is something that uh, Aslam is currently looking, uh, looking at it. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, we are moving into the uh, GitHub flow. Uh, and and we want to have a cent central versioning system so that you know um, in any case uh, for 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 
a variety of reasons. Somebody you know who just joined, they want to see like what are the services there, what are the versions there, um, and not only that, it's like when we have uh, something uh, come back from part or something, then we want to see which uh, roll back to which version and all that. It will be easier. Uh, but to be able to do that, to integrate that with the, the, the CI and the CD that we have is not a, a, a straightforward matter. So yeah, uh, we are currently working on that. And then we have some of the scheduled jobs. So like uh, certain uh, services just run as a scheduler. So that also uh, is something that we still have not uh, been able to automate. Yeah. <laughs> so if you guys uh, are interested, yeah. 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 How, how do you handle database migrations if a feature involved needs uh, database migration in order to be deployed? So the data how do you handle database changes? Exactly. That is a very <laughs> good question, and that is something that. Uh, if, if, if we don't plan it properly, actually, with, especially with the large number of microservices, a lot of things can go wrong. Because like uh, uh, certain services, if you upgrade, uh, because like if you upgrade the database, you will have to upgrade the driver, right? And then the data format and all that. If you are not careful uh, about doing that, uh, certain services you might have upgraded the driver, some others are still using the old driver then there could be a lot of uh, compatibility issues. So what happened is that ideally, uh, uh, this uh, upgrade itself, you can call it like a feature. Like so, like you're upgrading, uh, let's say Mongo, you know, you can create a feature called Mongo Upgrade. So all the services, you can uh, just have the driver upgraded into that uh, branch itself. And yeah, uh, then it will not, have any impact on the, uh, the, the alpha environment. So I was thinking of something simple, like a, like a schema change, right? So say my feature A needs uh, a schema change in some kind of backend data store. Do you deploy a whole new data store with that schema change as part of the feature run feature deployment process, or how does uh, in our case, it's, uh, this is about data migration. Yeah. The data. Okay. Yeah. So we are using MongoDB in the backend. Mm -hmm. So it's, we are liberal in terms of the structure and so Yeah. You so have similar problems, right? Because so if you've got a, say you want to change, the, you have a, you know, some of your services rely on a certain format of object, you still have to kind of effectively apply a migration to each Correct. of your objects manually in the yeah. data store. True, uh, totally agree. If it is a breaking migration, mm -hmm. we make sure that there is a data fix before we make any kind of changes. Uh, that's one way One way we have really done in the past. The other way is that uh, we also done it in a certain way where on the fly converts. You know, yeah. uh, because if you have a, a, a collection which is not touched all the time, yes. there's no point in actually going through this migration for millions of records. Yeah. So what we do is the other way of migrating that is like only when I test it. So just convert it on the way out, convert on the it on the way in, but leave the thing still. Yeah. Now I was thinking of doing that. I was yeah. wondering if other people did that and it was saying yeah. so. <laughs> We are on the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so like a lazy migration. Yeah. 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 The thing about it is you could end up with like very, very stale items that might not be compatible with like your latest code. It's no, we actually um, uh, commit the change to the uh, this thing as well, collection as well, right. uh, along the way. We don't actually just uh, combine the output and send it back into the clients. What we also do is that if there is a need to change, like for example, we change the password encryption from simple MD5 to SHA-1, the way we hash and keep and store the password. So uh, we retain both for a short while. And once we see that, you know, it, if the key does not exist, we will create a shell and hash, and then delete the previous one. So that's, that's how we did it. So, but, but that's a classic case, right? We can't even do migration in that, yeah. uh, that case. Because in that case, we can do only on the fly. Because we don't store the enough uh, X password anyway. Only when you log in next, I have to do on the fly conversion to shell one and then keep it. So that's one way we're doing it as well. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. So in the beginning, the uh, database changes. Uh, the database itself can be exposed as a service, right? Uh, yeah, true. Uh, the way we are doing it, like in terms of uh, services, we just have like a couple of types of microservices. One is a CRUD or a data service, which actually owns a particular entity. So the, the way we are trying to do is that, like for example, order is a pretty key entity in our uh, service uh, in redmart.com. So we don't want to actually <coughs> let any service that the code uh, changed uh, you know, that entity any other entities in that collection. So for that, we make sure that there is a current service, which, which is the only way you can go on and just, uh, so yeah, that's, that's how we restrict. Yeah. Then uh, the migration may not be uh, very because it's really low price for that. Precisely, precisely. Yeah, we can do a, you know. You can uh, have a version or version of the yes, exactly. Yeah, we can do that because of this constraint. And in production, the database you use is a you take the sample from production in all the environment. Or it's a copy of production. It's the other way around, but it's, uh, uh, we actually mask away all the sensitive information. There's PDTA, as you guys know, <laughs> which, 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 was, which went active last year. So we don't want, we don't want everybody to be accessing uh, the you know, customer email, phone numbers, and all this stuff. So uh, what we do is uh, basically mask all those. <coughs> information. But the volume or the number of users is basically similar? Uh, it is quite close. We do this on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, my version, uh, there was a thought process that I had that you can have a different version of microservice separate and all that. Yeah. And uh, you don't even have to have version number in the API. If you have the app ID map to a version and store it in the database somewhere, so that every request coming in, you know which version this API is for, for the app ID will indicate which version right. is for, and you can do a routing for the respective. Yeah. yeah, true, it is definitely possible. And uh, in fact, uh, the next, uh, that's a good point, and uh, we didn't talk about that. One part is, like the other, <coughs> other person mentioned, it's about containers, right? So one other thing which we are actually looking at is um, service discovery. So that way, you know, I don't have to actually go through this entire layer and uh, do the routing and then like, so we are looking at uh, direct point-to-point -point communication. That's a bigger project which we are attempting in Q4. Uh, but as of today, we basically, you know, did the routing and make sure that, okay, uh, we, we basically, uh, we use like most part of it, like 95% of what is there in the alpha and just create new smaller instances. It's, it is very cost effective for us as of today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's possible. Um, I want to ask, so um, all you're talking about is you create a new feature branch, you spin up a new server, so you can allow all your code to the user. Okay. So it's more the application side, not about the data. So um, let's just say you use MongoDB. Do I have a own MongoDB instance attached to that instance? Or we, we do a sharing and testing model the creating new collection of Yeah, I think we're just using the same number of clusters for uh, the future tests. Yeah, so when so you do a clean up, you will also clean up the data or just the data? Sorry? Um, so when you do a clean up, so okay, when this feature is done, will you do the data clean up also or just leave the data in your model? Only it's a breaking change. <laughs> yeah, we, we do that only if it's a breaking change, like a, you know, a particular data uh, and a schema version doesn't actually work with the rest of the versions. We you know you clean up the um, but do you have a feature feature specific data data set or database for that data feature or all the testing and sharing the same? It's staying, it's sharing the same database. Yeah. yeah, and the thing is, uh, with uh, MongoDB, we're just using uh, uh, mostly the basic driver, which is just a dictionary. If I have one extra field or the one uh, less field, you know, the you know, application doesn't break, you know, most of the time. Uh, we had very, very, very few you know, instances where we had to make sure that there is a data migration in place. Password was a good example, and we changed the strength of the 
hashing and there was one other thing for payment for example we had to do that but otherwise it's it's fairly lenient I would say because it's just a dictionary. Yeah, I'm just wondering so you have two feature graph. One is the written the record and the other one is fetch and then you have fetch it. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's uh, no this at least in this tool we don't really care about that uh, like possible race conditions and all that stuff. That actually applies in the uh, queue case which we were mentioning. What used to happen is that the stable uh, development uh, branch from where we are actually creating orders, for example, which goes into RabbitMQ, the feature would have picked it up and vice versa. So there used to be a confusion of where, where did my order go and it is breaking or whatever it is. That's the part which we are actually trying to do it either with uh, uh, routing key within uh, RabbitMQ, which is part of uh, you know, AMQ, uh, right? Or you could potentially use a separate queue itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, but otherwise, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, we could have done that, that, uh, that as well. Uh, DLS, uh, it's a sort of lot of money. Actually, if you see, are you talking about money? In this case, we just have. Uh, uh, we just have two HA proxies for our entire infrastructure. Why do you use time It is actually quite straightforward if you look at the uh, changes itself. Um, we didn't want to actually pollute the, I mean, uh, use the Route 53 to do that. Instead, that's actually a very valid question. You know, uh, uh, because uh, any uh, pain point that you wanted to do, because recently I have started using Route 53. Yeah. No, no, no. You should, you should continue to use that. But there is a better way to do that. That's what we are talking. We were talking about earlier on. Uh, I'm sure you, you guys must have uh, heard of something called Zookeeper. Uh, uh, we are. Uh, I've played around with for quite some time. But uh, there is one more thing called uh, Console. Uh, that's that's what is we are actually experimenting on. Uh, as you might have uh, seen, it gives like cross uh, data center support, and also it has. The same things what you need, like uh, what you said, um, you know, DNS and uh, ma management wise, it, it is a lot better than actually doing it through Route 53, I think. And you also get uh, distributed configuration management and health checks. So it's like uh, Zookeeper Plus, I would say. So it has a lot of things. And also, uh, if you have used uh, Zookeeper, especially uh, as a new a newbie, it is quite hard to set up this whole thing. But console is not not like that. You know, you you get the same kind of functionality or even better, but uh, it's e much easier to manage. You know, that's that's what we are actually heading towards. Once we do that, I agree totally with you. And as I said just a while ago, we won't need this uh, setup. But what we will still have is that some of the concepts which we which we used here, where we'll use n n minus uh, one you know services from the alpha, which is in the stable build and just one new instance we'll be creating. That way it is still cost effective in terms of the number of services we are running. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, and so the whole layer of whatever you saw, HA proxy and all those things, uh, will be gone eventually. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, 140 servers are serving the complete infrastructure of the Is there any hard logic that we have developed to size down the infrastructure? Ah, good question. Um, w uh, there are two things. One is we have a health check. Uh, we are using a tool called Cabot. Uh, it's uh, C A B O T Cabot. It's an open source tool, uh, which is which is pretty good. You know, you can uh, it's slightly better than you know what you get uh, out of Cloud Watch, and uh, you can test test that. So that's that's one tool we are using. And uh, the second part, uh, sorry, what is that the one you mentioned? See, uh, oh, scaling, scaling. Yeah. So, yeah, no, no, we haven't done that yet. So, one thing we are doing, uh, if we get some time, Q3 or definitely for Q4 is auto scaling. The good thing is that we already have the necessary recipes to uh, bring up and you know to bring down the you know, instances. All we need to do is hook up with uh, auto scaling uh, groups that uh, AWS provides. Uh, that's a fairly easy thing to do from here. 
thinking about cost I want to ask. So we are using um, plus instance, so your chat license um, is expensive. Chef is open source, it's free for uh, but the chef you are not using chef server, right? Uh, no, it's uh, so it's the solo client. No, server, right? so, yeah, we do but the not the enterprise. Enterprise, it's not enterprise, which is a free version. Yeah. Yeah, it is chef solo. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's not for the chef price, one no cost like five USD or not. If you are launching a bunch of retail micro, very hard to justify the cost. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it was the same uh, argument for new relic also for example. <laughs> right? It's even more expensive. So that's why we started actually building uh, something with uh Kavort and uh, we are relying on uh, CloudWatch and also we are relying on uh, a new tool called Sensu, you must have heard, Sensu app. So that is also pretty good. Uh, we used to use Natios and uh, other things in the past, so Sensu is uh, basically a new kit on the block. I mean, it's been there for quite some time. So that's what we are using for monitoring and that's yeah. But will it be more simple, for example, to use immutable infrastructure, let's say, optimization is a Docker, just bootstrap in the environment, the framework, which can be bootstrap in five minutes to test it, and just kill it, it That's a very good question. As we discussed earlier on, we, we would like to get get there, uh, you know, you know, containerized and uh, the whole thing. But we don't want to rush into that yet. You know, this is working fine. Um, I totally agree. The, we are just taking one step at a time. We wanted to automate this. We, you know, our team suddenly grew. We wanted to see how to actually make it simpler for the team. So this was the first step. Second step, as we as we mentioned just a while ago, it's to do the service discovery, uh, which is exactly like the gentleman was telling. And uh, the next next step would be to use container like exactly like you were, were mentioned. We could do that. That that becomes more like a template kind of. Thing. Eliminate all the problems with the management. So yeah. Just leave all away. We we could do that. Yeah. Did you use uh, sh uh, like Docker in production? Yeah, I use Kubernetes. With some oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that comes as part of it. Yeah, how big is your cluster? Like how many? Yeah, yeah because the so Docker also have a swarm, but it's still very. Yeah, it's not that, exactly. Correct. The the whole field is in quite a bit of flux, right? There is a new tool every day, so and then, uh, something which works today may not work in you know, a week later. So that's why we are, I mean, we are not rushing into that. I know there's a lot of things you could do with that. Uh, that's why we're kind of uh, doing a waiting game. Uh, this is working out quite well for us right now. But the next step is service discovery. That's, that's, that, that will be pretty good, I would say. Console is a good tool. You are sending energy to the Good question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we actually have been using uh, this uh, cluster since 2012. Uh, it's self-managed. And the good thing is we hardly manage anything. Uh, we went through uh, two different versions, and uh, it was pretty pretty good. It was... Uh, the sense of communication and sharding. Yeah, everything is done ourselves. And uh, the other thing is, uh, the important thing we are using is the uh, MongoDB monitoring service. That's a free service. You should all be, you should definitely use that. This is uh, provided by the TechGen uh, folks itself. It is awesome. And uh, you can also uh, purchase uh, backup and uh, you know, one click upgrade and all those things that's possible. But we need to purchase that option. What we have is a, a cluster with uh, replica. You know, at least a replica size is like two or three. And uh, we do have one hidden slave, which is like a, mostly like an insurance for our data, which is away from the you know day-to-day -day access. So we use that. Uh, uh, it is actually with a slave delay of a uh, few seconds, a uh, few hundred seconds. So that if we not something goes wrong, we can cut that uh, uh, server, server from the replica side and you know, make that as a master and all those stuff. So that's, that's what we have done. Uh, good question. I mean, we are not. We are definitely not talking about big data in the sense of large numbers. 
in terms of transactions, we do anywhere between 2,000 to 2,500 orders a day. So that's, that's the number of orders we're getting. So which means that we have multiple number of uh, catalog lookups, multiple number of active card removal to cards, and all the stuff that happens. So it's just a funnel. If you look at it, the end of the funnel, we have about 2,500 orders uh, a day, as of today. Any indicator of transferring direction that we have encountered? Uh, we never act. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we are using this framework called Play Framework uh, you know, for a long time. <laughs> So it, it hardly you know, consumes any you know, CPU that we have had any issues in terms of uh, processing. Uh, I see you smile. Is there any issues that you run into? No, no, I love my framework. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Good to know that. Yeah, we've been using it since uh, 1.2. Uh, it's like 2.3. And uh, most of the folks are actually moving into Scala and Arca and all the stuff. So yeah, that's, that's where we are. We, we have uh, huge traffic spikes, like when we have sales or like GOSF, uh, I this year and all this stuff, uh, but it just uh, works pretty well. Okay, uh, the feedback was good, uh, like what we could be improving. Was there any other feedback that we can take, we can improve? Actually, I have a question. Sure. Uh, we didn't talk about the OSS you are using, right? Linux, uh, Linux using Linux, right? Yeah. How do you uh, manage them? Because you, are you provisioning them? Are you provisioning and storing and then reprovisioning? Uh, how does it work? So it's, uh, we are using the, the bare bones Linux, which uh, uh, Linux AMI, which uh, AWS provides. Uh, I if you're aware of that, they have a stripped down version of CentOS. Yes. So we should just use that uh, and uh, we don't do anything more than. Uh, more than that on top of it. Uh, of course, back in the days, we used to prepare such instances, like um, a stripped down version of the kernel and all that stuff, but uh, these days we just uh, use off the shelf instance. So, how do you update them? Yeah, we update them, yes? Yeah, yeah. We do update them. So, how do you do uh, it? It's done. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I have to be honest. We don't do it regularly. So, it's all when uh, somebody's deploying a new feature, for example, they find that they're like, 48 updates to be done, you know, they basically do it. We haven't automated that part yet. That's a good question. Do you do, you do automate it already? Uh, so what we do is, um, we have we use Packer. Okay. With Packer, we take the, uh, we also have NWS. So we take the CentOS 7. Okay. We have uh, current uh, types of uh, OS we want, like the database, uh, web, whatever. Yeah. And on top of that, we run uh, ansible jobs, which would provision on them. Okay. With the bare minimum, then we store the MI uh, inside the MI store. Yeah. Then we are experimenting with this thing called Terraform. Sorry? There is Terraform, yeah, yeah. Yoshiko. Yes, yeah, so we yeah. use Terraform to uh, okay. spin the, the whole stack. And then we have a second set of ansible provisioning, but more like configurations and uh, specific aspects. Yeah. So, and we are close to the immutable uh, strategy, which is uh, we don't update the instance, uh, we don't do yum or whatever, we just trash the instance. Okay. Yeah. And we represent a new one based on the, uh, I mean, we create a new page, and then we work. True, yeah, that, that, that's, that's one uh, way we have been doing for certain uh, cases. Just trash the instance and then uh, create a new one. So it takes a lot of time. Yeah, uh, but in EC2, it's not that, uh, it's not a lot of time, right? It's pretty easy to. Uh, you know, spin a new instance. The good thing is when a new one comes, it's already up to the uh, patch mm -hmm. level we would, uh, we would like it to be. Yeah. So that, that has worked out well for us. So you can test that uh, before running out, you can test it actually to make sure it's there. Yeah, it's true. I mean, using Packer or Terraform, uh, that's something we could definitely do. We can be you know, doubly sure that the, right from the OS level, it's working fine. But in our case, it's just a Java application, and you know, we would really uh, what is so much about the uh, OS level and stuff? Uh, I think that's up to me. Yeah. When you're spinning up a bunch of, let's say you have three services in a feature yeah. that you need to test together, uh, how do you get the order right? How do you make sure they're all about before you start and you test? Like if one needs to connect to another, mm -hmm. uh, when it starts up or something? Uh, 
just have timers, or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, uh, we haven't done the timer set, that's one thing we want to do, but it's done manually uh, as of today. Uh, but uh, what we want to do is, uh, uh, another thing which we want to use is also uh, feature switches. So today, a feature toggle is a feature switch as well, depending on the number of people who call it. So we want to use it to, first of all, control the deployment and the availability of feature itself, but also use the same thing for uh, you know, kind of uh, staggered roll off of the service and sensor. So I can prepare the instance. I have a feature, but I won't turn it on. It's only till the you know, flag is turned up, which is like, you know, happens in a, a moment's notice. That's what we're doing. So, how do you take your deployments on Shapur? How do you take your deployments on which is ready? Uh, uh, the, for the uh, chef configuration itself? Yeah. No, they're not doing not on our based uh, tests yet. Sure. Yeah. We should be. We should do that process. That's right. Yeah, because I agree. Some of the memory leaks. Yeah, we, uh, I totally agree. Because we are working from Java to Congo, the driver can be implemented. Any process can be implemented. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Yeah. 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 Do you test your channel code? So do you use any like um, service back or something like channel testing tools, kitchen? Do you test your channel code or just? Uh, like we be honest, we are not really doing that. Actually, the biggest advantage of using a CM tool is exactly like what you said. I can version the entire infrastructure and test it. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, we are not done that. We we tested, we tried it uh, very early on, like in uh, uh, end 2013. We know that tool like this and then necessary uh, systems are uh, sorry uh, configuration or the tools are all available. Uh, we didn't put it to production. Are you using it? Um, so I, I wrote both. So I maintained out one couple. So I will do some service back or something. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's just a simple things like. Okay, after finish I run in this code book, is that process exists in the in the system for the method? Yeah. It's simple stuff. True. Yeah, and that's that's a big advantage you have with uh, the FCN tool like sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We had one engineer uh, for for about uh, six months. He built that initial chef uh, infrastructure and all the stuff, and he wanted to become the product manager. So I lost the DevOps engineer. After that, uh, it's only like three, four months ago we hired uh, uh, the new one. So uh, this is one person. There's one other person joining uh, next month, uh, next week. So it's two. And the Aslam joined a couple of weeks ago. So he's uh, taking care of the release aspects. So it's about three right now. Three means how many developers? It's about 60 plus, 60 plus developers. The thing is we are changing quite a few, quite a lot of things. We have a like, lot of new features. It's not just features. We are also building a uh, lot of different things, more than what you're seeing in the, on the website. Uh, so there are a lot of... Uh, different projects we are trying. So that means we have a lot of you know, uh, different feature teams getting created. Uh, yeah, it, it is it's just quite a tricky situation to be in. That's, what, that's what's really covered in all of the slides. So psychologically, are the developers have the same thing with the interface? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 is doing, it is doing okay. Actually, this is what we try to cover and you know, infer. Uh, the good thing is, Something like this, a simple tool to change that whole thing. You know, initially it used to be like we use Slack, and there's always a, an, a, a message coming to DevOps saying that I need this, I need this. You know, uh, so we automated some of those things as well. We use IFTTT to basically, once any, somebody wants anything, it just goes into Trello board, and we'll do it once or twice a day instead of actually jumping on it. Uh, minimizes the context switch. That's one thing we have already done. And uh, some of these simple tools, though it looks simple, you know, it's doing quite a bit of stuff in the infra. So that's that's helping out as well. So 
So have you released Python in your kind of slack? Yes. True. Yeah. Uh, we, we did, uh, what we also have is uh, uh, the git commits also come to Slack itself. So if at all I want to comment, I can just comment there itself. Uh, I normally watch the Slack channel itself for any kind of comments, interesting ones, and I, you know, I use that itself. Yeah. Slack uh, we are using quite heavily, whether it's for this purpose or DevOps uh, requests or anything for the matter. That's good. Uh, uh, thanks for all the feedback and the question. Uh, it will definitely make us you know, do this better. Uh, as I said, this is uh, just a first step in what we have been planning. And uh, we just didn't want to jump into uh, most of the you know, shiny stuff that we see there, whether it's Docker or anything else. Uh, the best thing, uh, I mean, the most important thing we are looking for Q Q3. Or the uh, latest by Q4 is console. And uh, if time comments, we would like to share. And if somebody else is sharing a service discovery, we would like to definitely come in and listen to you. Okay? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I Thank would you. say let's have a drink and some food downstairs if you like. Um, it's half past eight, so half an hour. We can have a discussion ongoing, yep. if you like, here or downstairs. What do you Thanks think? for having us, and uh, yeah, we could do it anyway. <laughs>